Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. How many years have you been in Colorado Springs? I guess you went there because that's the Olympic. I have this business maybe there since 14 years, and maybe I spent there, if you add all the time, five years, six years. And you selected that because of the Olympic Training Center uh, headquarters in Colorado Springs? I selected this because I was the first time with German Federation. Yeah. For eight training. And then in Colorado Springs was always a track World Cup. They have a nice velodrome. I think it was called 7-Eleven Velodrome. There was always a World Cup. So I went there and there was attitude training. And I like this place. And then I started working with USA Cycling for the Olympics in Atlanta. I was there again. And then when I made my road trip in the US, because maybe you know Bob Stapen, he founded Voice Stream in the US. And later he's had a, his own team. It was called um, High Road, T Mobile Woman and High Road. And he said, Ah, you should come to Seattle. And then I had friends, they say, no, you should come to Los Angeles or San Diego or now. At the end, I decided for Colorado Springs because it's more relaxed than Boulder. Because you would think, go to Colorado, you should go to Boulder for cycling. And right. Boulder is, I think right now, with all the restrictions and the hate between cyclists and um, car drivers, it's much bigger than in Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs is much more relaxed and there's no restrictions. and they are very nice people. Even people think from outside, ah, it's a military town. Okay, if you're a military guy, maybe you like it there too, but there are a lot of other people too. And it's, for me, a very good place to have a business in the U.S. I like it. Now, you mentioned your daughter. Does your, your family travel with you as you move around from time to time? There's kind of a vagabond lifestyle you have where you're two months here, three, four months here. Yeah. My daughter loves Colorado. She was after me the most time, my daughter. But ah. she's doing filming. She made just a new film with the team, Bike Exchange, Yalula. Uh -huh. She just launched this yesterday. So she, she likes filming. But she does a lot of other filming too, not only cycling, filming, also for others. So she is a film, a filming artist. Being on the tour, having your product on the tour, has required you to be at a lot of these races on a regular basis. You have to be out if, or do you have to be out there? What have yeah. you, uh, Me, I think I was 20 years at the tour, 20 times. Yeah. And at the highest, I think we had 180 cyclists at the Tour de France using our product. 180, wow. this is almost everyone. So we were there with, with three people to give support because we already provided the bike computer and the power meter. Because at that time, there was no Garmin and no Wii existent. So there was as I am or no bike computer, so. Now being out there, getting that feedback from the riders had to be an incredible advantage for yeah, you. Yeah, but there are two different kinds of cyclists. There's the guys of called um, um, Contador. Yeah, they Contador. want very simple. I want to see my power, my heart rate, my speed, my cadence at the time. Nothing more. Even Lance Armstrong too. He said, Uli, I do not record. I have my numbers. I see my numbers. And then it's history. I need this now as precise as possible, basta. And the other guys, they want 10 times more information. They're always pushing the buttons on the bike computer. And they <laughs> sometimes I feel they lost the concentration. What is cycling about? And then I had a talk with, um, maybe you know, Andre Greipel. He yeah. told me at one point, Uli, they should forbid bike computers because this is also a reason for so more crashes because they get distracted. They look on the bike computer of the navigation. They should look on the road and see what is a 100 meter coming. And yeah. they don't need a computer. This is the same like on your car. You look always on the navigation, not on the road, and then you end up in the river. Yeah. But anyway, so anyways, we have the bike computer now and this should be, 
The problem is you have to turn your head to look on the bike computer and then you cannot look on the road. And then even if it's a pre-selected course and then in the race, maybe there's some barriers, some other is different, and then you cannot follow what is the course, what you have in your bike computer. What's been the most enjoyable personal reward for you from living this demanding life? Because there's no off season in what you do. And so uh, it's been pretty much relentless during your life. And so what are the rewards and what has this been worth it to you personally? And what are those things? Do you think about that much? Yeah, because I know sometimes a cyclist gives me the bike. I got, for example, one of the super bikes for USA Cycling, this, the, what they had for the Olympics. It was presented by me by Steve Chong. Lance Armstrong gave me the bike. He won the Tour de France with a yellow jersey. Thank you. I have a bike of maybe 10 other pro cyclists. I have a bike of Kreipel. I have a bike of Alex Sabel. I have a bike of, and they gave me the bike and said, Oli, this was all you had. And then maybe with five, six signed jerseys. And I hang them all on the wall. This is, I think, from a cyclist, the biggest thank you to get the bike with a signed jersey. You can hop, hang up in the office for you. Because if you make a product and the athlete gives you back a thank you, with the bike he was racing and winning something, I think this means the most. Yeah, plus this is something that you grew up loving from as a child and along with your father. How did your father, did he live long enough to see you, is he still alive, and to see you do this to the industry? That's got to be a, a great source of pride for him. He was happy. He died early and he had not seen the end but he had always a picture of a power meter in, uh, on his work office. He was responsible. He worked in Munich for the subway. So he was responsible to get the parts of the subway, the underground running in Munich. So he was also an engineer, underground engineer. So yeah. he understood what I was doing and he appreciated it a lot. Do you feel like, uh, I know big thing right now is you want to get this new meter out is there any one big achievement out there that you haven't done because you pretty much have dominated your industry and now you're doing it just for the fun of coming up with it it's like improving the iphone basically with your improving your power meters because one reason for you to do it is because you know nobody can do it like you and uh, it's going to be interesting to see i think everybody's interested to see what you're going to come up with but For you, what is the big thing that would give you the biggest charge in terms of happening over the next year or two or three? Okay, so power is still power. And this is, for me, the most important thing because this explains your strengths. But I think in the future, it will go to have a bike computer that tells you how to make your training more smart and more intelligent. And to make your training more intelligent, it's maybe nice to measure your power, your heart rate, your speed, but probably it would be good also to see the lactate in your body, the sugar level, and some other things for training to make your training better. But at one point also, I think at one point it gets too many data and you get an overload of information as a consumer. And I think sometimes less would be better and you reduce it really to the important things, really to the important things. And I have really to think deep what are really important things. Maybe it comes out, it's your body temperature, your body temperature and power, or some other things, but not too much, because an overload of information in the training actually reduces the focus on yourself, because you are looking too much on the numbers. And at at the point, at one point, You have also, I would not say listen to your body, because sometimes I remember when Lance Armstrong, uh, when Craig Lemond got world champion Chambery, he told me, Uli, every lap I want to quit the race because I felt horrible. It was a shitty day. I didn't want to finish, but at the end he got world champion. He beat Konishev in the final sprint. And he said, Uli, sometimes you cannot trust your body feeling. You have to think that the other are maybe the same struggling as you 
and you cannot see this and they feel the same shit and at the end you can still win. So sometimes it's hard to say listen too much to your body. Sometimes you have to go through this and see, okay, the other have to do the same and then still you can be the winner. So I would say find a balance, listen to yourself, listen to the data, listen what the coach tells you and what the family tells you and find your own way. What you think at the end, you have to listen to yourself, but also put in consideration what the other tell you where you are. The answer on those power meters might be that you have a power meter for your training when you're in your training with the lactic acid and things like that. But when you're racing, you have a much simpler type thing. You identify the things that two or three things, and that's all you see. So it could be that it's the readouts you're looking for could be different depending on what stage you're in. You know, if you're training, you're developing, trying to develop the sprint, the tempo yeah. for the long, long hauls or... For the cyclist in the race, it's important simply to know how much fuel you have in the tank. Yeah. But this depends a lot how quick you can regenerate, what is your nutrition, or all the other things. So it's not easy to calculate this really correctly. And then you have also a really important thing is your motivation and also how your strengths, how you can suffer. If you can suffer a lot, maybe more than the others, you can still win even on the paper, you are weaker. So this is the other thing. Maybe on the paper, you are the strongest, but you are the first one who get dropped because you feel too much sorry about yourself suffering now. Right. And they do this. So Yeah, and anyway. I'm sure you've seen that play out. And at the end, what you've done is just created an incredible tool for the racers, but at the end of the day, they still got to go out and race and win the race themselves. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So anyway, thanks, Uli. Let's get together down the road. Oh, Thanks so much, Uli. Have a great evening. Thanks for the time. Thank you for the nice talk. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealamwinning.com. Thanks for listening.